Hello and welcome to the podcast, 10 Lessons That Took Me 50 Years to Learn, where we dispense wisdom to an international audience of rising leaders. In other words, in this podcast, you'll hear valuable insights that you cannot learn from a textbook because it took us 50 years to learn this stuff. My name is Jeffrey Wang, the founder of Professional Development Forum and your host. This podcast is sponsored by the Professional Development Forum, which helps diverse young professionals of any age to find fulfillment in the modern workplace. We're excited to be joined by Narelle Hooper. Narelle is Editor-in-Chief at the Australian Institute of Company Directors Magazine and is a non-executive director of the Ethics Centre, formerly the editor of AFR Boss, Australia's premier leadership and man management magazine. She has worked across print, broadcast and digital media for the biggest media companies in Australia, including AFR, BRW, ABC Radio News and Current Affairs, SBS TV, and Medium Rare Content Agency. In 2015, she co-authored New Women, New Men, New Economy on how sustainable leadership drives performance and innovation. And she also co-founded AFR's 100 Women of Influence Awards. Welcome, Narelle. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, and thanks for taking the time to interview me. I'm fascinated to see how it's going to emerge. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're very excited to have you, Narelle. To call you a trailblazer would be an understatement. Oh, I'm blushing already. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just jump right into it then. Let's start with the very first business lesson that you've learned. My very first business lesson was a painful lesson. I had a background as a cadet journalist and I'd just been appointed to a new role, which meant jumping a couple of pay grades to a technology magazine in Sydney. And I went up, put my best clothes on, went off for the interview in Sydney and sat down and they were going to hire me. And then we got to talking about pay and they said, right, so what were you were expecting when it comes to your pay? And I, of course, immediately blabbed. I wanted to be a grade up from where I was. So it was something like a B grade, for example, at the time. And they went, right, sounds fair enough got the job and I got the pay and I did manage to work in a three-month transition and review period but I found out later that they were prepared to pay me two pay grades above what I'd nominated so wow. I had immediately done myself out of probably 20-25 grand and it was a, an enduring lesson about just keep your mouth shut when someone asks you to name a dollar figure in a ne negotiation or in the parlance for negotiating languages don't open first and I'm really lucky I got the three months review in because at that point I realized my mistake and I managed to get the increase but three months at whatever the lack of money was <laughs> I paid for it over time <laughs> Don't open first. There you go. All right, let's jump into something that you have unlearned. So what have you unlearned? What I mean by that is something that you believe absolutely to be true when you started your career, but you have found out later that's not the case. Oh, wow. There's a number of lessons. There's one in particular that, that was a big lesson. And that is when you set out on your career and you've got aspirations, you've got the stars in your eyes and you've got your aim, you've got your goals that you set. And very often they're things like my first car or my first house, or I like this handbag or whatever the nice piece of equipment and shiny stuff is that you set your gaze on. And, and that's all very fine, but I've come to realize over time you forget about that pretty quickly. You might have some short-term satisfaction in that, but it, it doesn't add up over time. And those deeper investments that you save up for and make, they stand you in really good stead. But don't fuss about the shiny stuff and the brand name watch or the brand name shoes or the brand name handbags or clothes or the best kind of stuff on the street or whatever. You'll save yourself for money about that, but it also, you come to realize it's a projection. It's not a reflection of your inner self. Fundamentally, it's much more important to have an internal sense of satisfaction and then your relationships with other people. So that was a really important one. There was a secondary lesson around that, which is to learn to listen. 
very often once you've got the gift of communication, it's really tempting to fill the spaces and to talk a lot. Um, but the art of listening, and I mean like really listening, is gold. Absolutely. Okay, so don't chase the shiny stuff and learn to listen. I like where this is heading already. <laughs> So on your list, you've mentioned everyone need to feel like they belong. Now we all know that, but what do you really mean by that? Oh, a sense of belonging it comes at an individual level and a, you know, a organizational level and a national and international level. But I, I, I just want to back up a bit and just talk a bit about how I learned that and how it, how it came to be an important value for me. Mm. I grew up in country in New South Wales, out near Millthorpe and Orange, and it's one uh, Wiradjuri country for of First Nations people. My family had not had a lot, but they'd grown up on a, a farm, and we had a dairy farm, and my mum and dad worked really hard. My mum actually worked as a maternity sister at the local hospital, and she did night shift for like, I don't know, 12 or 15 years the poor thing and my dad who was a very gregarious and curious person who'd been brought home to run the farm when he probably would have been preferred to be an electronics engineer or something he wound up buying a pub <laughs> so in addition <laughs> to running a dairy farm we ran a pub and so for many many years I always remember that there was always a spare bed if anyone needed it very often we'd have people staying who were whatever life circumstances they were going with and there was always a sense of being made to be welcome and, and food on the table. And it didn't have to be a lot of food. It was just a generous sharing of what you had. And that to me has become a core value. Mm. I, I was the first one in my family to go to university and then went on to study journalism. And in the roundabout way, eventually that brought me to Boss Magazine and the focus on management and leadership. And mm we'd often have events where I got to meet you in fact in the, the professional development forum and it was really important to me when we we're bringing these older executives together with the younger executives and there's a lovely energy in that space but to make people feel welcome uh, and that uh, they'd be recognized and acknowledged and included I, I still find that it's a good feeling that you have yeah, and yeah. if you think about yourself as an individual when you often you going to an event we used to in the days pre-pandemic right before we <laughs> Zoom. it was like a lifetime ago <laughs> it does and you'd walk into the room and you might be on your own and you might be feeling a bit awkward and not that confident and and so forth and one little lesson out of that I, I think I learned this from some other senior executive was if you're on your own and you see someone else on their own just take the time to go up to some other person and just get talking and you can just make them feel a bit welcome. You feel better. And then, and, and just include people. It's a spirit of generosity underpinning. It's, mm, I'd like more. us to have that at a national level. Absolutely. Um, you've got to secure it and look after people, but you equally want to be welcoming to those people that you um, allow to come into your country and in, into your home. As a former migrant going into a country that uh, it was new to me and not being able to speak much English. I could still remember the way I was made to, to feel welcome by the people who you know, I met at the time. Now I was a kid migrating to New Zealand as a 10 year old. You know, you could just imagine new language, new environment. And yet that generosity just transcends all sorts of barriers, which is just incredible. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that when you were younger, you had people sleeping over and, and <laughs> staying over. And surely that exposure um, to so many different types of people with their you know, varying stories and background, that would have really opened your eyes up to <laughs> you know, exactly what the world has to offer, isn't it? Well, as someone who's had to leave their country and go somewhere else, you've had to take your courage and your hope for a better future. And you take all of that in your hands and you're exposed to whatever life brings to you. And, but you've taken that step. And that's mm -hmm. that kind of migrant mentality is actually a really important one for entrepreneurship and so forth. And you sparked a memory when I went to, um, to school, this little country place in Millthorpe, there were kids from Poland because there were a lot of post-war migrants. We used to share our lunches. <laughs> they liked my lunch, which was a bit dull. And I <laughs> loved theirs. And we had Italian kids and some Greek kids as well. And that, that was a good kind of feeling. When I went to primary and high school in 
Blaney, I, I remember that there were other kids who were from migrant families and they were not quite in um, a good position. And some of those kids got shunned in the class. At the time, I didn't know any better about what to do about that. But to this day, I, I reflect about how hard must that have been for those kids to get up and go to school and to know that they were going to be treated that way. I would never want that to happen to anyone that I dealt with. That's just something I just don't think is a good value. But the time you see this behaviour, but um, helping kids to understand that you can make someone feel welcome, I think mm. would be a good counter to that. But it was the kids that were included and the kids that were excluded. And it's, that would have been a really scarring mem memory for some people. And I wouldn't want that to happen. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> but I like to look at the silver lining and all this because of how you were able to connect with and across these cultural barriers and mm. the likes. I, I'd like to think that because of your ability to have these relationships with people who are so different to yourselves, that would have helped you somewhere in your career. That sense mm. of curiosity, and it's a journalist mm. quality in many respects, but I think mm. that came from my dad because even though he was brought back and had to work the farm, he was a people person. He had to end up working with lots of cows and would have preferred to work with lots of people. But he was always reading widely and always questioning and that curiosity about uh, other people, other places and other ways of thinking mm -hmm. that I really like. And it, it does make for a very busy mind mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of your life. You join lots of dots and I, I think there's a real there's strategic benefit around that. And um, increasingly as the world's moved on, it's a way mm -hmm. of network thinking. It, it builds its own momentum in terms of business development and your own career opportunities. So absolutely. Yeah. Good. I heard a former SAS major general speak the other day on, a, on an interview and he was saying, we often talk about the difference, whether I'm male, female, my racial background, your sexual preferences and so forth. But he said, fundamentally, we're all human and that's a common element. And that's the thing that really should bring us together as opposed to what, what makes us different. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> I absolutely agree with that. So lesson number three, you mentioned take the road less traveled. Ah, the old, uh, who was that? Scott Peck, was it? The road less traveled. After I went to university in uh, what's now Canberra University, I loved journalism and wound up eventually back in the press gallery in Canberra's political correspondent for Business Review Weekly magazine. Mm -hmm. It was the days of mobiles, but pre-social media. And you're operating in Parliament House and you'd hear a story would be in the wind and everybody would be charging after that particular story. To do my job properly on a weekly magazine, when everyone was charging, I had to go, why? <laughs> and to question that. And very often I'd find that the real stories were either in the other direction or in a little dark corner that not everybody else was looking at. And um, oh. you go and explore something, you just start that question, like, what's going on and why is everyone doing that? And what else is happening? So that kind of questioning, I got some really great stories out of that, which ended up being cover stories for the magazine. I was nominated as a, a Walkley finalist for a, a story, which goes back a long way, but that was the kind of questioning. And, and the other thing that goes with that is just observing. This actually operates in investment bubbles. So everyone's piling in on the share market. You're kind of going, hang on a minute. <laughs> There's a point that you want to maintain and it's risky to be out of the market. But equally, you go, what's really going on here? And is there something else I should be looking at? I was just thinking about that. In the age of Twitter and mm -hmm. social media and information overload, He's, does this still hold true? Is a group think that was happening back then in the mobile but pre-social media days, is a group think worse back then? Or is it in going to hyperdrive right now? Ah, oh, yeah, good question. I think it still applies. I think social media has been great for airing perspectives that we might not have heard mm. previously. And sometimes you can see an issue that escalates when people get onto a fact. Mind you, that's a whole other conversation, right? Because of the infodemic, but what, what you know, real versus imagined facts. There is the social media pile on, like the pile on Twitter. I really value Twitter for bringing ideas and research reports and perspectives to my attention that I might not have got from my other sources. But equally, it can be brutal and it can be. I think it was David Penberthy, a columnist I read recently, and he said it can cultivate the mindset which is. I'm right and everyone else is an asshole. Excuse mm. the French. 
it's, it's a pretty harsh old world. <laughs> mm-hmm. The judgment is immediate and not a lot of reflection. And I think taking the time, not join the pylon, is to just stop and reflect and think is more vital right. than ever. So basically, lesson number three holds true then. <laughs> don't, don't join <laughs> the pylon. Let's look the other way and see what we're missing. <laughs> Yeah, it was good for life in the days when we travel. Hey, it's good for Australia now when we're, <laughs> we're forced to stay at home. So you take the road less travelled in country New South Wales or <laughs> like that, Queensland. So uh, many levels to this lesson, isn't it? I know, this, this goes on. But I, I did a trip in uh, August. I took a week off and we did just that. And I met some amazing, lovely local people. And thankfully it had rained a bit and they were in much better spirits than they were the last time I'd been out last year when the earth was baking and the drought seemed to go forever. Wow. (laughs) Okay, so lesson number four. Now, this might be interesting. You have the power to influence. Mm. It's about, and I learned this through a friend of mine. So the the story that she told me was that she was a young executive at a company and she'd been in a a meeting with uh, a really famous kind of management researcher or something. And she'd been in the room and she'd not said a word through this entire meeting. And she got out of the meeting and afterwards and just mentioned that she was too terrified to say anything. And he turned to her and he said, do you know you have an impact just by being in that room or at the table whether you speak or whether you don't speak we often get so worried about what would happen if we actually spoke or if we talk too much or whatever but it showed to me that contrast that um, if you're in the room or you're at the table you will have an impact now whether you choose to speak up or to back someone else who's spoken which i think is a really important element Mm. influencing or whether you're so self-conscious that you don't speak up, you've got the potential to influence that outcome. And you can either take it and, and give it a go or you lose the opportunity. Hmm. There's an extension with that by not um, speaking up. Sometimes you become part of the, you know, the problem, the problem to use the cliche. Uh, this is a very interesting lesson. I'm, I'm thinking of the context of someone who potentially is not used to speaking up or they mm. may be from a culture that speaking up is not desirable mm. trait or, or that they just haven't been raised with the ability to speak up but mm. what you're saying here though is that just by being around the table or being around to support those people that speak up on your behalf you do have the power um, mm. that a, a lot of us don't often perceive that we have well, you've landed on a really important element of that. There's cultural differences often, mm-hmm. and there's also communication preferences mm-hmm. and, and, and thinking differences. If someone's chairing that meeting or you're the chair of a board or a, you know, a leadership team, a, a really strong and underappreciated element of leadership is to be aware of those potential differences and to make sure that you have genuinely included everyone in the conversation. There's that word again. Inclusion. Inclusion, (laughs) I was talking about this just today with a colleague of mine. We were doing some communications and we were learning from this. I'd had a um, good meeting with a a guy in this team. He was an engineer. He was a bit more of an introvert. The idea was that one would tell a story and the other would listen and then you'd ask questions and do the reverse. He was telling me his story and I was making eye contact going, what? That's really interesting. And I'm very interested in the story. And I got feedback from him that he found that eye contact to confront him. And that, that was really interesting to me. So I, I then just started to observe a bit more and I realised that his way of communicating was actually to drop his eyes a little. And then someone today in talking about that, they said that they're, in their community, too much eye contact was be, viewed as impolite. <laughs> and then there's that more formal sense of what's appropriate to take into consideration. And, and on top of that, you've got people like to hear some people are more kinesthetic and feeling in their uh, communication preferences some people um visual and and so forth it's been helpful just to appreciate those differences and not rush to fill the space the quietest person in the room will very often have the best input and sometimes we miss that out because we don't give them the time to reflect and bring them into the conversation so that's the agility in terms of being aware of those elements of communications Absolutely. All right. Lesson number five, look out for landmines. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a good story. <laughs> They're not actual real landmines. They're <laughs> political kind of power, dynamic landmines that mm. can make or break your influence. And mm. the story with that goes, that was a time where I wasn't aware of the politics and the organisation. Mm. There's always the politics that goes on. Sometimes they can be constructive and just knowing there's the formal power structures, but then there's how decisions are really made. I wish there was a lesson when you're in high school that they could just teach you all this stuff. So, you know, <laughs> for a period of time, I'd been at the ABC and then I'd moved over to a role at SBS TV. And there was a particular event that happened with the journalists and the organisation wound up uh, in the industrial relations as, as a, an issue. So there was a bit of public scrutiny on this. Our little team of the people who'd been involved and had been affected by this, we, we were quite upset about things. So we had a form of communicating what our views were. and. I found out later we'd actually really embarrassed the management and there could have been a, a better way to handle that. We were just so blindly concerned with what we felt about it. We didn't think about how to best influence the situation. Yeah. So I, I learned to my cost <laughs> in that situation. We weren't a team any longer. <laughs> It was a really good lesson in terms of just really being aware of the, the politics, not necessarily buying into them, but there's a mm. way of influencing. And very often you can quietly inf influence things behind the scenes and doing the work to understand that as opposed to being so passionately caught up in mm. the rightness of your issue that you're not aware of what other potential uh, concerns there are around yeah. you. So what would you have done instead? If you had to do that again, what would you have done? <laughs> I wouldn't have written a, a letter to the editor of the national newspaper along with my co-workers. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> I would have handled that in a, a, a much a quieter internal way and exhausted that for, I would have attempted to have resolved the issue that way. And before I'd taken it, well, what have they taught you? You go to force 10 straight away, as opposed to working your way up through the various exhausting the various options of influencing but like I survived I got a few scars it was a really valuable lesson and I've just kept that in mind sometimes you can just not be alert to what's going on so like mm -hmm. the power dynamics of every organization that's how things get done yep. or not done and learning and understanding the influence that's really helpful thing like you often hear people say, oh, I don't like the politics and everything. And I'm not mm. talking about being overly political, but mm. it's about influence. But I wonder if there's a way to learn such um, <laughs> ways without really, you know, <laughs> incurring a few scars on the way. Yeah, well, I think you're right about the scars, but I think that's why having an older mentor, people who have war stories or they've knocked mm. a bit of bark off along the way and those kind of older heads it's always good to have someone like that around and you, and you can test your thinking mm. when growing up we didn't really talk about mentors or having that kind of support and you either lucked on it or you didn't and for a long time I really didn't luck on it <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized I've had a couple of quiet mentors and just people who could give you a really hard-headed view of what's really going on here and asking a couple of tough questions and just realizing you can actually tap in those people it's like having a personal board you know of advisors informal people to help guide you on the way failing lad you've always got this podcast <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yes <laughs> all right number six now i love this one it sounds like you're traveling a lot put on your oxygen mask before helping others ah yeah that's um so that advice in the days when we were flying more frequently, it's a good one. It's not about putting yourself first. I care passionately and I've got a, a strong sense of social justice, a strong sense of wanting to leave the world in a slightly better shape than I, I'd found it and so forth. I think sometimes we can be so caught up in those matters that we lose sight of the fact that it, it all starts at home. It starts with you. You can be off saving the world when... Maybe you need to also pay a bit of attention to your neighbours and those in your family. And I think you start with that circle, like if someone's trying to save the world and having really dysfunctional personal relationships, or if you're not sleeping right at night, then it's, it's telling you something's not quite right. <laughs> yeah. During the lockdown period, I live in an apartment block in a, you know, near a park. We've always known our neighbours re reasonably well, but we got a lot closer to the, our neighbours, the people in the street. We'd see them every day all walking out, trying to get their exercise. 
we started saying hello, <laughs> whereas we might not, we were so busy going from A to B previously that we didn't even very often bother to say hello. Mm. Just dropping off some food for someone or just checking in on someone or leaving a mm. sign just saying, look, you know, if anyone needs anything. I think over the last 30 or 40 years, we've, we've, you know, we've succeeded a lot. There's been a lot of economic development, but very mm. often it's hollowed out the local communities. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've noticed that, haven't I? Like we're, we're talking about global issues like climate mm. change, but yet the charity starts at home. And, and I think we've missed a bit of the local community, even mm. if it's just a local Christmas pamper drive or even local car wash or sausage sizzle and all that. I, I do think that there is a, a bit of that being lost. Mm. But I'd like to just touch on another point that you mentioned mm. about sleeping. So how much of that is also self-care as well? The thing mm. is you can only help others when you're in a position to i could only imagine if a person's exhausted and tired and sick you're not mm. in a position to help anyone else i went to a lunch a few years ago and the dalai lama was speaking it was full of a lot of middle-class professionals and like myself and we're all curious to hear what the dalai lama had to say and someone asked ab about what's the best advice kind of thing he said so how is your sleeping and the woman said, oh, not very good. He said, first, you need a good sleep. <laughs> and it, it went on, the conversation so went on. But he said, if your sleep is disrupted, you're not getting the rest that you need. In order for your brain and your body to function properly, you do need to get a, a reasonable amount. You, you need to rest. Understanding now more about neuroscience, we know we need to give our brains a good rest. And if you're not sleeping well, and if you're not um, eating, like just caring for yourself, and I, and I don't mean caring for yourself so much that you're so obsessed that you're not doing anything else but just a level of self-care like our physical bodies are what carry us around and just being careful to look after them and do basic maintenance and care like you would for whatever vehicle you either drive around or be it a scooter or a bike a little anecdote about that is that while i was working in parliament house in the press gallery and my dad died at that point and i did a lot of self-reflection someone had introduced me to yoga and so I went up studying to be a yoga teacher and that's one of the best pieces of education I ever did because it's, it's it teaches you about philosophy it teaches you about there are times you just can't control the world and you've just got to submit to events and also to be kind and gentle with people as well yeah. and I still do yoga to this day and it's hard work it's my best friend and my harshest critic at times but it's kept me in, <laughs> in good physical shape <laughs> Oh, that's good to hear. Beautiful. Number seven, respect those who ah. came before you. This sounds pretty profound. Oh. <laughs> uh. Are we talking generations? Are we talking civilizations? What are we talking about? So growing up in country New South Wales, mm -hmm. we knew a lot about the local history and the gold rush and the farmers came out and everything. We didn't hear about very often the, the women's stories, but more than that, the story of the people who lived in that area before the coming of the European settlement um, oh. was so rarely told. So I didn't know a lot about Wiradjuri country and what went on there when it was settled in the 1830s or thereabout. I think I think we're the poor if not knowing about that history and about the great traditions of the, the First Nations people. And then I went to the Gama Festival up in the in Arnhem Land about 10 years ago. People are inc incredibly welcoming. You come in, you sit in the dust and you don't say much for a while and you just be. But you understand that the collective wisdom that travels together over, you know, generations is really quite deeply profound. And it's a respect for land and people and, and the resources that it yields. That element, I think, is important. And, and there's your parents and your grandparents before that. And that, so there's that element that you're walking this way for the period of time that, that you're on the earth for however long that is. And then after that, after the job you're doing, someone else might come along or after you've gone and your kids, someone else comes after that. So it's just a way of being really aware that your time is a limit. Have awareness of that in terms of your actions and that something will come after you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In ancient Chinese wisdom, it's just oh. knowing how small our, our time frame reference is in the greater context of history and civilizations and the like. So I can certainly identify with that. Yeah. But it sounds to me like this is related to number eight, try to do no harm. Yeah, 
the and sick. I, I like that word try. <laughs> the, the doctors have that first do no harm is yep. that's a ba the basic element of the uh, Hippocratic Oath. Growing up as a kid, I you know I used to have slightly wild and household. Everyone had high spirits, high tempers. You get really angry. You were walking on eggshells sometimes because we were never quite sure what our mood our dad would be in. There's a level of issues around family violence that I, it's important for me that the women and men speak up about these issues but the first is to do no harm in your family circumstances but around that kind of thinking is to try to leave a positive wake mm. so and when i talk about wake if you take the kind of metaphor to water we'd have these kind of big loud arguments in the family and then it would all be forgotten and then <laughs> we'd just go on and, and, and whatever and when I got married my husband's family had a different way of dealing with things they'd get upset but they wouldn't talk about it so people would be walking on eggshells because they weren't quite sure what everybody was feeling but no one would talk about it so <laughs> the idea of the wake you're creating is you don't want it to be so choppy you want the excitement and fun and love and joy and so forth but you don't want to leave it so chopped up and crapped out behind you mm. that it's really hard for someone coming behind you even if it's just an interaction with someone in the street and I know you've got to very often do work that's not savory or you've got to get an outcome that's uncomfortable but it's still to make it a, a positive interaction all right number nine don't lose your connection with nature yes um mm. now this must have been something as because you grew up on the farm I'm guessing mm. Yeah, like we worked pretty hard on the farm. My job in the morning before I went to school was to get up really early and round up the cows. And so it'd be really frosty in winter or beautiful in summer. But ever since, I, the morning is the best part of the day and just getting out in nature, whether you're going for a walk or you can just see some plants or, you know, trees or sky or whatever. I found it a very nurturing kind of element during the during the lockdown in some places they weren't even allowed outside in sydney we were at least allowed to go for a walk and get some exercise in the day and i was lucky enough to have a park nearby and then the botanical garden so just to go and be in that space we are fundamentally from nature mm -hmm. and that it's a very healing space sometimes when you're feeling you know a bit tired a bit irascible and like you've had not a very good week or year or whatever just being in the park or going for a walk and getting some air I think it's a really healing thing we've had a period of time where very often nature has suffered we've got the great work of capitalism which has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty but we've externalized the costs on that and yep. nature suffers because it does you know very often we don't put a value on it this kind of work of foot now to do that and value our natural capital but in the meantime we've got a bit of restoring work to do on that and ostensibly we know climate change is an issue it's clear and present danger and we've got to deal with it fundamentally by bringing more of nature into our lives and our world it does make us better and it, it doesn't mean you've got to go out and what's that show i'm a celebrity get me out of here but they all go out <laughs> the crazy jungle i don't mean that <laughs> <laughs> it's living in harmony with nature i think it's yeah when, when i can kind of the work i do I, I do get to look at the larger trends that are driving society mm. and the economy and that responding to climate risk is a fundamental but that macro trend about nature is a really important one we're starting to see buildings now where they're being designed where they're drawing in more elements of nature into the it might be plants down the side of the building biomimicry is an element of that we look to nature for inspiration in constructing materials and structures for the, the man-made world all right the last lesson then <laughs> probably my favorite lesson <laughs> always have good hair and shoes <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense to me, but I'd love to hear it from yourself. All right, so this is a bit tongue-in-cheek. Working in TV, very often doing the kind of public interviews that I've done, you do learn that we're all judged by our appearance, rightly or wrongly, but we are judged. With, you've got about one to three seconds and you make up your mind about someone. And in TV, in particular, women are judged very harshly on their, their image. And very often on telly, I'd be doing a really interesting discussion panel and then you get feedback from the audience saying, what are those earrings she's wearing? Why did she wear that top kind of thing? We need to move on from that and just accept people who are professional and well-crafted and communicate well and so forth. But it's a tongue-in-cheek way of saying 
that I, I always thought if whatever goes wrong, provided you've got good hair, people will forgive a lot. <laughs> and I just mean being neat and well presented. Yeah. And the issue around shoes, if you're fortunate enough to have feet to put your shoes on, it's just nice, neat shoes. So being professionally well turned out doesn't have to be expensive, just good quality and neat. It's a really ba basic thing, but I always just used to say, oh, well, whatever happened today, at least I had good hair. <laughs> That's right. That's very good value <laughs> advice. And <laughs> thank you so much for taking your time out to speak with us today. I've always admired how you've treated those around you from our interactions when we first met when I was running the Professional Development Forum and when you're at Boss Magazine. And I can certainly see a lot of the, the values that you've carried throughout your careers that's got to where you got to today. So really appreciate that and the advice that you've given us. Thank you, Jeffrey. And I've just so admired the work that you do with the Professional Development Forum. I'm great to know you over the years and I want to thank you. It's, it's such a cool idea. So thank you. And thanks to the people who are um, listening and watching. I really appreciate it. And I hope it's been some help and I've learned heaps <laughs> as well. Thank you. Thank All you. the best. Bye-bye.